I was told, we only have 20 minutes, so I'll try and make it punch in a case. I was right. told people want to hear about cybersecurity, but I think that <laughs> is selling the breadth of your technology background way too short. So okay. I'm going to rewind a little bit. Um, we can't give you credit for creating Google's business, but you're certainly the man who scaled it globally. And I think it's fair to say that business faces an existential threat today. I don't use Google anymore. Um, I suspect many people in this room don't either. So in the age of AI, um, give me your perspective on how you see search and Google evolving. Wow. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Nothing like a starting lowball from my friend Alok. Um, look, I lived in Europe in 2004. I used to run Google Europe. And I remember at that point in time, the internet was just sort of getting to full bloom with search, et cetera. And we were all delighted to find information on the internet. And in a way, at that point in time, the discourse was that the existence of Google has made information more widely available and hence democratized information. And a lot of people have access to information. They can do a lot of things. And on the back of that, a large commercial business was born called Search, which for marketing people is the idea of lead generation. And I think AI is at a place where we're going past the democratization of information, uh, in my opinion, to what I'll say democratization of intelligence. So now you expect AI to respond with an intelligent answer. It'll tell you how to send a rocket to space if it has enough data to tell you how to do it. It might even help you find the drug that you need to cure cancer. So it, it, there is a big systemic shift that's going to happen around democratization of intelligence. As it relates to prior information models like search, I think uh, there is a reasonable probability in the next 10 years they all get disrupted because we are no longer searching for information. We're actually looking for outcomes. And that's, that's the whole, I think it, this is a long, it's not more than 20 minute conversation. I think the entire app, app economy of 5 million apps on the iPhone is going to get uh, turned its head upside down in the next 10 years. So you're an app company, be wary. You're about to get re-intermediated, mostly disintermediated, but re sounds better. Okay. Well, let's just leave it at that because you're right. This could be a half an hour conversation. Um, I'm going to shift gears to another business that is being disrupted in a major way, and it's a major way, and it's a business that you and I have, you know, in terms of our paths crossing when we were at SoftBank. Um, we invested in every major Uber competitor in Asia anyway. That's At right. some point, I think it's fair to say we were costing Uber um, $100 million a month. Yes. Uh, so it's sort of ironic when I heard the news that you're joining the board of Uber last yes. <laughs> month, right? So we've sort of yes. come the full circle. So talk to me about the Uber business model and ride sharing in the era of autonomous cars with Tesla, Robotaxis, Waymo, et cetera. Well, well, first of all, I have not been to my first Uber board meeting yet. My first Uber board meeting is in next Monday in New York. Uh, but look, what's fascinating is it sort of goes back and connects back to AI. If you believe AI is going to be touching the information industry, the application industry, the content industry, it is also going to touch the physical industry, the physical world. And I you know, was listening to the panel before, the notion that AI will eventually get arms and legs in the form of humanoids, in the form of robots, in the form of cars that will be driving themselves. So in that context, we are going to see a lot more automation and application of AI. Effectively, the idea is, how much money do I have to invest to eliminate the task of a human? That's an agent, right? So the world's first agent is a driver agent, if you will. Because for the first time, you can actually have a car that drives itself. You don't need a human being. That is 100% agentic in the way it operates. So if you believe that the world is moving towards a 100% agentic, autonomous driving experience, I don't know if it changes the Im or it impacts the Uber or slash ride sharing model. I think what it does do is that you have cars that will be driven by humans. You'll have cars that will be driven by themselves. At some point in time, economics matter. Can I, you know, what is my cost per mile? And I think we'll see a hybrid model. I think the more interesting question becomes, socially, what does that do to car ownership? 
who funds the purchase of these tens of millions of cars. I, mean, I heard from the Waymo CEO the other day that they can run the same number of trips with perhaps a third or a quarter of the cars that you need with humans. Because you can just sweat these cars, they don't get tired, they don't want to go take a nap, they don't drive eight hours, they can drive 20 hours as long as you can charge them fast enough. So I think it'll have an interesting impact on the efficiency of number of cars that we need on the road. Uh, what kind of businesses will get spawned out of that? Are we going to have businesses that clean cars, stack cars, charge cars? So it's going to be very fascinating in terms of what it does, but I think it has a bigger impact or ability to change the way car ownership exists. It also, linking back to cybersecurity, it dramatically increases what you describe as the surface area. In terms Attack of vulnerability. Oh You've been exactly. exactly. Well done. Yeah, no, exactly. I've been doing my homework. Fantastic. But so talk a little bit about that in terms of the implications for your business. Oh, uh, well, look, in 2005 or so, the iPhone came about. When the iPhone came about, all of us got used to apps. All of us got used to connecting, to, connecting everything to the internet. Today, it's like, you know, when electricity would go out, we wouldn't know what to do for work today. If you have no mobile connectivity, you won't be able to do what you do, or you wouldn't know what to do. The gentleman sitting there watching his phone wouldn't be able to do that because you know, mobile connectivity is gone. So from that perspective, the more you connect everything, the more you connect your car, your television, your humanoid robot doing you know, electricity grid control, or pick your favorite topic, the more connectivity there is, the more the potential for bad actors to get their hands on something. I was telling somebody this morning, in the context of autonomous cars. You know, in the old days, you can watch a movie where these guys show up, they try and kidnap people, put you in the car, and you know, put a gag on your face and drive you somewhere. We've seen those movies. Well, now all I gotta do is hijack your Uber or Waymo. I don't have to show up. I could be sitting 2,000 miles away or 5,000 miles away. If I can find a way of cracking the code, of hacking the car you're in, I can lock the doors and drive you very far. Or, or tinker with your brakes, God forbid, right? I mean, there's a yes, lot of bad yes, stuff you could Yes, do. yes, yes. Yeah, that's generally my job, to make people scared and then sell your cybersecurity. <laughs> so we can't not talk about Tough Bank. They actually, get, <laughs> they actually, with two of us on stage, they actually gave me a badge that says, Soft Bank, I turned it around because I had three people come up to me and ask for Masa's phone number. Got it. But, uh, you have it. But, uh, but seriously, um, among the, in the book tour I did, um, probably the most interesting question I was asked, and I think I shared this with you, and I'm gonna turn around and ask you that question, which is, if Nikesh had succeeded Masa as CEO of SoftBank, how would things have been different? Now let's get a little bit granular. This is provocative, and I appreciate you don't wanna get into critiquing Mr. Son's strategy, but what's happened since you left was the 100 billion vision fund, there's 500 billion in Stargate, and there's OpenAI, you know, 30 billion committed. Fair to say, Masa arm. at this point is the is the most arm. Of course, was the first thing that got done. So, put all of that together, and uh, we know you and I both admire Masa. We love him, but give me kind of a sense of uh, what you might have done differently. I have, honestly, I have never thought about that question. It's kind of like sliding doors. That's a part of our life that kind of went away differently. But it is an interesting question anyway. So it is, but look, yeah, yeah. I say this about Masa, for those of you who follow Masa San, uh, as all of us get older, we tend to get more risk averse. You know, it's from the day our kids, my son is here, from the day our kids are born, we tell them, don't touch this, don't eat this, don't do this, watch on either side of the road before you cross the road. If you're Indian, our parents tell us, get married, have kids, settle down. Like, you know, this is a bad idea to have high standard deviation in your life. Masa is the other way around. The older he gets, the higher standard deviation he gets, the crazier he gets. So his risk appetite is, I have not seen a human being in the world whose risk appetite increases. It says, it's like, it's like he, you think he's trying to shock you, say, I'm gonna invest 10 billion. He looks at you and says, you don't look impressed, 50 billion. And then Donald Trump says to him, Mr. Son, why don't you make it 100 billion? He starts laughing, okay, I'll think about 100 billion. 500 billion. So he just gets egged on by the idea of having high standard deviation, higher risk, and to his credit, he's been successful multiple times in his life in making large bets. At the same time, he's also seen his wealth go down to zero with that. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think I could be him. No, and no, I think I tell you the answer I gave, which I still believe in, which I think if Nikesh had succeeded as CEO, I think you guys made a great team. But I think the, from a market valuation perspective, I think investors would have appreciated the 
more conventional, disciplined thinking, rigor, and maybe the discount to the sum of the parts would have been narrow, but you probably would not have done some of the wilder things he's done. Some of which have panned out, Arm in particular, have panned out spectacularly well. What is the market cap of Softbank? Um, I think it is, it's still 50%, 55% discount to the sum of the parts, but I think it's like about 110. Actually, it's about the same as yours. Okay, good. All right, is, so is that about the same? We're about 130, but who's counting? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, let's talk about cybersecurity. So um, I actually did listen to a couple of the podcasts you did recently, and uh, you know one of the um, one of the terms you use is you've seen the evolution of cybersecurity from a hobby to a profession. So unpack that for me a little bit. Do you mean profession in a very narrow sense, in as much as the people who now do this for a living, or is it much more sinister, you know, when you say professional and I start thinking in terms of like, you know, is there a diploma or a law firm or a consulting service, people who just like, you know, well, gang up, it's an apprenticeship model, people who just gang up together and then they do cyber sabotage. I mean, so like, give us a sense of what's going on. Well, look, uh, since I said this is a very new industry, it started in 2005 with the advent of the iPhone and connectivity. In a year, about $28 billion is is spent or lost because of ransomware attacks, which means bad actors get into your system, hold you to ransom, and take money. Um, and they've gotten pretty good at it. There's companies who will do critical vulnerability attacks, and then they will sell that to a whole set of people who live and negotiate ransom attacks. So it's about $28 billion. Uh, unfortunately, it's the best bad business to be in because the conviction rate is two to five people a year. Imagine you could steal $28 billion, only five people get arrested. You know, it, it's, it's not a good idea to steal an iPhone on the street, but you can go s s steal $28 billion and only five people get arrested. So from that perspective, you know, unfortunately capitalism works like that. Where there is money to be made, more people go there. So a lot of people have gone there. If you couple that to the fact that in many cases, these are nation state sponsored activities, because this is how the nation states get capability and stay on top of their toes where they know if they want to disrupt something or somebody or some company or some country, they can do that because they have the skill set. Look, it's clear with the last two wars we saw or we see in Europe, 20 to 30% of the effort is cyber. This 20 to 30% of the warfare is happening on the cyber front. They're shutting down each other's logistics systems, they're attacking financial systems, they're attacking electricity grids, they're attacking water supplies, and why would you send people? You know, sending humans with arms is the most wasteful and the most inefficient form of war. As you're discovering with drones, with you know, autonomous amphibious vehic vehicles which are being made. So five, 10, 15, 20 years from now, most wars are gonna be fought without human beings going to war. In that context, cyber is unfortunately a very big competitive advantage from a nation state perspective. So it is a profession now. Yeah. So Talk to me about your approach, which is which has been in a valley context quite unique, right? Because you've made what's the exact number of acquisitions? Is it 21? 20. 20. Okay, so um, the notion of platformization, the acquisitions, integrating them. Just talk a little bit about. Some people may be familiar, others may not be, but just talk a little bit about what the strategy is, what the end game is, whether you're done or whether there's more to be done in the era of AI, agentic AI. So look, uh, it's a very simple business problem. Either you're in a consumer business or an enterprise business. If you're in a consumer business, you try and build the next Google, the next Apple, because you can sell everybody an iPhone, get everybody to search. If you're in the enterprise business, you, you, you want to aspire to sell a lot of things to your customers. We could become a Microsoft with $3 trillion. So in our industry, there is no large singular player who can sell a lot of cybersecurity solutions to one customer. It's very fragmented because it's a 25-year-old industry. So we set about to say, what if we became a one-stop shop where we can deliver most of the cyber solutions to our customers? And if you go back 25 years, you know, CRM was not a thing. HR workflow management was not a thing. ERP was not a thing. These things all evolved in the last 25 to 30 years. And you have companies like you know, ServiceNow or Salesforce or Work, et cetera, who exist. So in a way, our approach is just to try and become one of those players where we can be the cybersecurity platform of choice, just the way they are the platform of choice for different things. So in that context, you know, enterprise companies have to have great products. If you lose sight of product, you die as a tech company. Uh, we cannot be 
doing all the innovation in the world ourselves, there are about 3,000 cybersecurity companies funded every year by venture capitalists. So we just keep an eye open and go find the best five or 10 we can and watch their progress. And if we find somebody who's about to break through in an area we think is gonna be important, we go, you know, we eat humble pie and go see if those founders will work with us and we buy them. And, and talk about the challenges associated with integrating that with, within Palo Alto Networks. How have you gone about that? I mean, I think you've, you've, you've got some, you know, got a very interesting view on that. But talk well, about we only buy number one or number two. You know, companies are number three or four in a category for a reason. So usually number one and two are more expensive than number three or four. Uh, when we buy the company, we make the founders senior VPs of our business, which is antithetical because normally companies buy you and say, meet your boss. Well, we tell our people, meet your new boss. We just bought his company. He's made a lot of money because of this. And he really kicked your ass with no resources out there. So he's going to teach you a thing or two. So that's kind of different for us. Um, before we close the deal, we sit down together and come up with a joint strategy. It's like we say, we're buying your company. Let's agree on what color we're going to paint your house because now it's my house. Don't argue afterwards. So we have a joint product strategy. We have a committed founding force. And then we tell the founders, the way you have skin in the game is we will take all your equity away. We'll give you twice as much if you stay here for four years. So we reward them handsomely, uh, we make them in charge, we get our people to work for them, and we have an online product strategy and let them go. 16 out of 20 have worked, four haven't. I think we have time for one more question. We'll make it about cybersecurity. So talk to me about your strategy and cybersecurity generally in the area of agentic AI and then in the future, quantum. And time frame for quantum, by the way, because the bid offer I've heard Jensen talk about 20 years, others much shorter, but talk about that a little bit. Look, um, on the agentic front, we will see more agentic AI in consumer, and we'll see agentic assistance in enterprise. And the difference is, in consumer, the risk of making a mistake is low. If you get an agent to book your airline ticket, book your hotel room, book your restaurant reservation, or buy you a dress, and they make a mistake, the cost is not that high. It's okay, you live through it, it'll be a shitty experience, you won't use it again. So you'll see a lot of these apps will turn into agentic apps, they'll help you go buy your favorite thing from Amazon or they'll help you make a reservation in your favorite restaurant and you won't have to go to an app and enter 14 forms to get your, your DoorDash or Uber Eats or equivalent uh, delivered. On the enterprise side, precision is more important. If I make a mistake, bad things can happen. Right? If I make a mistake, you may not get your loan or you may give a loan to somebody who's can't defer, and you know, I was talking to a bank CEO this morning, he said, we cannot give control to AI until our regulator agrees. So on the enterprise side, it'll take a longer than on the, on the consumer side. A lot of people will try and take these agents over because they're easy money. If I can take your agent, I can make it do things on my behalf. I can steal your identity, I can make it do things for me. So you will need a whole bunch of cybersecurity from an agentic perspective. Uh, on the enterprise side, we will lose, use a lot of agents ourselves to try and protect you by looking at different cyber attack techniques, et cetera. So you'll see a bit of both on the AI front. I'm sorry, I'm trying to speak fast because quantum. it says time out. Yeah, I know, quantum, very quickly. Quantum, uh, quantum will be used by bad actors before it will be used by good people. <coughs> because uh, the technology will get there, the, the protocols are not fully defined, the keys are breakable. So every cybersecurity company is trying to build new keys which will not be breakable by quantum. We don't have a protocol in place. But imagine there's a quantum computer that gets unleashed and I can rent cycles because today, you know, we're, we're selling before we're building. You can rent AI data centers before they're ready. So somebody will sell you quantum before it's ready and you'll be able to rent it, use it. And the first activity will be how, what if I can break the keys of a company and break their cryptography? Okay. Cool. And cure cancer at the same time. <laughs> and yeah, we're, uh, we could keep going. Thank Probably you. we'll keep going over lunch. But, uh, I think we need to cut it short. Time's out. Uh, thank you, Nikesh. Thank you. Pleasure as always. Thank you, guys.